so here's my uh, first slide, right? So here's uh, what we have. Um, so my current work so far. Um, so I've been I've been here for like thirty months now, right? And uh, I've been mostly focused on synthesis up until now. Um, so uh, this was my first paper. It was made from the. It was part of my kind of so uh, I, I took my master's thesis project and then you know I, I did a little more extra work, and then I kind of wrote it up as this uh, paper and published it at the, the Haskell Symposium, right? Um, and let me just show you what that involved. So uh, so it's embedded in Haskell, you know, functional programming language, right? And uh, so Haskell uh, used to have this. Uh, nice thing called typed holes, right? So you, you, you give an underscore and it says um, that uh, it gives you some context information about the home, right? And usually what you do is that you do this in live code, right? And uh, uh, and, and it would kind of figure out from the context the exact type of the code, but we can also use it here um, to give, you know, just, you just give it a specific type, right? Um, so, but what I did uh, is that I extended this mechanism, right? Uh, and added this thing called valid home fits. So what what happens now is that when you enter a typed home, um, it actually kind of searches the context and searches the scope and gives you everything in scope that has that type, right? So here is everything in scope uh, by default from the payload that actually has the type of bool. So we have you know otherwise false and true, but also because uh, bool is bounded, we can do max bound and min bound, and it's kind of showing how. You know, we're, we're using the type checker to find everything in scope. Uh, and of course, this is not a very interesting type. So let's look at, you know, int to int. That's like a list uh, to int. And then we get more kind of general types, right? We get head and last. Um, and it kind of figures out that, yeah, if you put the first type variable to be int, then this type matches. Another one here is like also length, right? And it says, well, if we match the two type variables, so the container is a list and the element is an int, then this would actually uh, type check. Um, and then uh, I sent it a little bit further uh, and I added these uh, refinement uh, the refinement level home fits. Uh, uh, so here, um, so what happens now is that, so, so you can see here that if I search for a function from a list of ints to int, I just get kind of exact matches. But I added these uh, refinement level home fits, right? So, and then we search for the same hole and we get the same fits as before, but we also get kind of fits with additional holes in them, right? So if I apply the function of hole del1 to something, to a function of type int to int to int, then the entire type of the function would match. So we kind of recursively structure the programs, right? And of course, like if I apply fold l with through a function and a, an initial value, then the function would match, right? So here we get the, the kind of the full yeah, and, and and we can go deeper and deeper, right? Um, so and that was my uh, what I did in this paper, right? So uh, then I extended that. So the 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 trick with this uh, thing is that you know the synthesis is very hard coded. It's very much like kind of what I thought would work, and I wanted to extend it, and I also wanted to be able to play around with these whole fits without uh, having to fork the compiler, right? So this was a, a poster at ICP and a, a talk at the uh, Haskell Implementers Workshop. And I actually got a, a second place in the student research competition for this poster. So, uh, and, and it was well, well received at, at ICP. So that was in 2019. And uh, so what you can do with this functionality is so uh, Haskell as a language has this concept of uh, plugins, right? So you can kind of extend the compiler by writing some code and then at certain phases uh, when, uh, of the compiler run, that runs the, the plugins, right? So I, I forked GHC and I added this uh, whole fit plugin thing to kind of give you options for how to deal with whole fits. Um, and this is what a whole fit plugin looks like. Um, so it takes in the typed home, which has some information about the scope and the and the um, and the kind of the, the the values that you know the givens and, and kind of the things that we know about this context. And it takes a list of candidates and it allows you to kind of modify the list of candidates. Um, and then it also allows you to modify the list of fits. So you can actually do different kind of synthesis based on what you need, right? Um, so this is a simple plugin, right? And so you kind of uh, inject it into this plugin architecture. And then uh, we can uh, we can load this plugin. 
and uh, then we enable the plugin uh, plugin and now uh, we still get a so what this plugin does is that it actually it kind of looks at the name of the hole uh, let me uh, this is a bit much if it uh, also refinement hole fits so it looks at the the name of the hole and it kind of filters things based on the name so here uh, for underscore it doesn't do anything but if I tell it uh, look look in data dot data foldable right and I can't write dots I had to kind of shimmy it a bit so it doesn't find anything in data foldable that matches this type but if I import from data foldable uh, length then of course it uh, finds the length function so it kind of allows you to, to to change the candidates and of course it allows you to change the fits and stuff like that so I'll show you how I use this later uh, to actually do kind of interesting synthesis using the plugins, right? So that was that the yes. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Uh, no, you can actually inject uh, whatever candidate you want, right? Uh, and then it goes through the fit checker, uh, and then so so the candidates here is everything in scope, um, and th then it actually then runs the synthesis. Uh, and it checks, does the candidate match the type, right? So you don't actually have to guarantee that the candidate fits the type, but you would like to guarantee that the uh, that the fit uh, satisfies the type, but there's no actual check there. Hmm. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, and there's a couple of different kind of candidates uh, based on where they come from and from the scope. And I'll actually show kind of interesting candidates that I uh, I had to uh, uh, write. Okay, so that was a that is this uh, uh, talk slash poster, right? Um, and then we have a uh, henprog, and that's kind of the kind of work current work in progress I'm doing. Um, and this is based on the the genprog program um, that was in I think it's in from 2009. Um, it's not quite state of the art automated program repair, but it's kind of I wanted to see you know what can we do um, with things that are already, you know, what can we do in, in Haskell and then kind of add on things to make it more state-of-the-art later, right? Um, so let's look at uh, how that works. Uh, so here we have uh, a simple Haskell program, right? Um, so, and it has a couple of quick check properties. So uh, you can actually, these are just unit tests, um, kind of disguised as quick check properties. Um, and, and then here's another interesting property saying, okay, so the idea here is I have a GCD program that I wrote. Um, this is like the example from the, the Genprog paper. And uh, it actually, it, it has a bug in it, right? This loop, this line here will loop indefinitely. Because, um, you know, if it has it hits this case, it will just go right into this case again. So it has, we have an infinite loop here. Um, but I would like the program to satisfy these properties. And well, I would also like for it to terminate, right? So then I can run this uh, henprog program, right? And uh, so it, it, it kicks off, uh, you know, it picks up uh, the properties, you know, it knows the type of the hole. Okay, this is actually, uh, yeah. So it knows the type of the function and uh, it knows what properties it should satisfy. And then, uh, so it doesn't really do kind of, so there's a thing in automated program repair called uh, uh, fault localization, where you kind of figure out where the error is and that's very naive at the moment. It just kind of figures out that, oh, you're always evaluating this GCD prime thing in this current module. So I'll assume that's where the, uh, I'll, I'll assume, you know, I, I pick targets based on what is being evaluated in the properties, but we will need to improve this heuristic. Um, and there's, there's a bunch of kind of good heuristics out there that we just haven't implemented yet. Uh, and then it goes off uh, and it kind of runs the program, uh, does some synthesis, and it actually figures out that, you know, if you replace this uh, GCT prime zero B here with just B, then the program will satisfy the properties and is in repair, right? And it's kind of cool how we can kind of, you know, so we have with genprog, uh, we just have unit tests, right? Uh, but because we have quick check properties here, we actually get kind of, um, uh, you know, uh, kind of a, not, not an infinite amount of properties, but we get a lot of actual unit tests from the properties. Um, but then now we have to consider, so what, what Genprog does is that it, it kind of weighs uh, each unit test and tries to, to kind of figure out or something that might matches all of them. Um, but we still have, so there's some research to be done to kind of integrate these properties in like, you know, 
how much should we weigh a correct property uh, versus a correct one unit test and stuff like that. And what it does is that it essentially, uh, it goes off and it just tries to, it just pokes holes in this program, like these typed holes. And then it uses a uh, custom uh, type checker plugin to actually, you know, do the synthesis and communicate back and forth what the fits are, and then just runs the program with those fits. Um, so, and, it, uh, and this is just kind of one uh, fix at once, but then we have a more interesting case here where we have a program with um, multiple uh, properties, right? So, um, no, so it has, uh, sorry. So, so here we have another program called uh, Broken Pair. Uh, there's actually a bro broken triple. triple. Uh, and the, the issue here is that we need to replace all these values. So essentially what these properties say is that, you know, this uh, this triple here should be 3, 4, 5. So uh, we can fix that as well. And there the, uh, the actual genetic programming comes in, right? So we kind of try multiple fixes and then we merge them together into... Uh, uh, something that works and uh, well it's not really doing genetic programming at the moment it's just doing kind of breadth birth search um but yeah so but this is kind of all work in progress and i'm kind of interested to see uh, where we can take it and um so this has been joint work now with uh, uh, uh leonard Apples from uh delft and uh, and uh, yeah he contacted me and said you know i think it's an interesting work uh, should we try and work together on it and uh, and uh, yeah, it sounded good. So uh, I have some help with the genetic programming part in that. And as you see, you know, it takes 12 seconds even with Zoom and everything running. Uh, but it actually does figure out, you know, you can have, you can, if you change three parts of this program, you get actually uh, the correct program. Okay, that is kind of my current work on automated program repair. Um, so the other part, of what I've been doing, and that was this mostly uh, last year, is these type checker plugins. Um, so the original idea here was, a, so we would like to be able to run programs, even if they have type errors in them, if those type errors are of the type that don't actually affect execution, right? So the, 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 the go-to example here is actually uh, the, um, the Mac library um, from, uh, from Russo and, uh, and uh, I think Stefan, Dan Stefan, right? Um, Okay, yeah, just Russo, right? So the, the so Russo allows you to uh, to annotate uh, programs with labels, right? And you have these, uh, uh, you know, you you kind of wrap values in boxes, and those boxes have labels, and then we make sure that you know, uh, uh, so so you have two labels, either uh, public or private, and we make sure that kind of private labels do not flow into public contexts, and thus they don't leak, right? And this is kind of is it called information flow control and has been a uh, big big uh, we, we've done a lot of work on that in uh, at chalmers and the idea is to kind of yeah we should, if we model in the types uh what can flow where we can actually know uh what um you know that that we can actually guarantee that that values are not being leaked and there's some kind of interesting cool new stuff coming on out of here and uh, as we saw it at, at uh, actually at max's uh, defense the other day but the issue is that you might have a program that's functionally correct. You know, it, it actually does the thing correctly, but it might be leaking some values, right? And uh, so, and my uh, my uh, motivation here was that, you know, if I want to automatically repair the program, I still want to be able to run the incorrect program if the only error is actually just kind of a type error that doesn't actually matter for runtime. And the trick is that uh, uh, that what uh, the, the way Mac is implemented is that it actually it just kind of wraps the value in this label, but the label is erased at runtime. So these will actually be represented by the same memory at runtime. And uh, so we 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 wrote this plugin to kind of allow you to ignore these kinds of type errors by using uh, kind of corrosions and and stuff like that. So they so they will be safe. And uh, we can actually, so here we have written a program and what it does is that it kind of says, you know, I will, so it allows you to, uh, first of all, allows you to default. So, you know, if we, if we have a label and we can't figure out what it should be, uh, we can just default it. And I think it, and it's all configurable and we all, we have these type families. Um, so we actually say, you know, if you can't figure out what the label should be, default to a public label. 
um, then we say uh, you're actually allowed to to let uh, public uh, to let private flow into public uh, or the other way around. But uh, but we we kind of give you a warning instead. So we kind of turn all these things that would have been actual type errors into just warnings because we know that they don't actually matter at runtime. And then, uh, you know, it, it gives you all of these warnings and they are all generated by this plugin. And eventually, you know, we come to the program and we can actually, you know, we can actually run the program, right? Even if it has a bunch of these uh, type errors in it because they're not actually relevant to runtime. And this is kind of key for kind of later stuff that I want to do uh, with, uh, you know, I want to be able to automatically fix these labels um, and then I need to be able to run the programs during synthesis, right? Uh, so that's what, that was the RIT plugin. Um, and then I've been uh, working a bit on that with Augustine as well uh, on something I call the data.dynamic plugin. And it's basically the same idea, except that instead of just saying, you know, this is actually the same value, uh, we state that, you know, it, it would be the same value like if you apply this one function to it. Um, and Haskell has these uh, the support for dynamic types. And to use those dynamic types, you actually have to use this these to din and from din functions that you know take some value and make it into a dynamic, or take a dynamic and make it back into a value. Um, and we implemented a plugin that allows you to to kind of go back and forth without having to write all this syntactic sugar, right? So here, you know, in regular Haskell, you would actually have to write uh, let f equals you know to din of a to din of b to din of C. And this is just, I, you know, for my sake, it's just too much work. I mean, it's just, you know, you know I just want it to work because uh, the, the, and that's the trick with the plugin is that we know that they have to be dynamic. Um, so we can actually just do this, right? So we can, we write this plugin and it's enable and it just says, well, I'm going to, I'm going to marshal this A to dynamic. And that's what we call it. We're going to just automatically promote it to a dynamic. And then in the generated core, like in the actual generated program, um, we we fix it by adding this to din call there, and uh, and uh, so and, that, and that's kind of I think that's cool, but I mean it's not that much. Um, so what we added now is that we actually support dynamic dispatch. So uh, what that means is that uh, I have a class here uh, which takes an A, and then I have two instances of it for A and for type A and type C. And then what I do uh, is that, you know, I can actually use this function on dynamics by building this dispatch table at a runtime, right? So I can actually just say, you know, if you're trying to run this foo function on a dynamic and it has a A underneath the dynamic, then just call the uh, the foo function at the instance for the A function, for, for the type A, right? And then we can do these dynamic dispatch things. And our idea is, you know, can we get like Erlang level dynamic stuff um, in Haskell directly. Uh, so, and we can actually run this and then it kind of, you know, runs it, it generates these tables and, you know, we can even generate it for ORD and EEK. Um, and we actually, you know, we get, get one warning, but it actually compiles and we can actually run the programs even though there's dynamic underneath. Uh, yeah, so that's kind of the current work I'm doing with, uh, with Augustine. And uh, yeah, so that's it, uh, what I've been doing so far.